welcome to the um, first Loch Arbor Area Committee meeting for 2023. Um, so do we have any apologies for absence? I think we may I, have... Um, I, I don't have any apologies, uh, Chair. No. Okay, thank you very much. And um, does anyone have any declarations of interest? Not me. Nope. No, okay. no case. So um, moving on, item three on the agenda is um, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Local Committee Performance Report. Um, welcome to and thank you for joining us, Mike Collier, Group Commander. Happy New Year. <laughs> Mike, you're, oh, you're on mute. On mute. So that's a good start to the new year. So thank you, Chair, for a happy new year to you too. Um, first, can I apologise for the lack of uniform? And you'll hear by my voice, I've got a bit of a chest infection. So I'm on administrative duties only at the moment. So if you'll be patient with me, I'll read my report, but I, I may have to pause to cough a couple of times. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll go easy. <laughs> you do your very best. Don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, so if it's OK, I'll just read what I've got in front of me and then we can have a discussion about any points that wish to be raised. Um, so good morning, Chair and Councillors, and thank you for the opportunity today to reflect upon the quarter three reports for the Loch Arbor and Ardermarkin area 22-23. Um, it should be noted that the report you have in front of you has some minor absence of reporting due to the festive period and there'll be some updates throughout my report which vary slightly from what you've got in front of you. The area continues to perform well and regarding the key performance indicators on which SFRS measures its local performance with communities the following is noted. Accidental dwelling fires, the figure for the period is 1 uh, on October, 2 November, 1 December. Of these two were in Fort William itself requiring intervention in firefighting and damage was limited due to the actions of the responding crews and they were identified as accidental dwelling fires. One of the fires in November was a deliberate fire within a premise in Glencoe, um, without many names in that, and it's a, it's a site in, in the middle of Glencoe that um, attracts, unfortunately, a lot of unwanted attention. Um, conversations are ongoing amongst local solutions for parties um, and that, that, that will continue. Um, these incidents continue to be well below the Highland LSO and national average. Fire casualties, fatal casualties remain at zero and I've done so for several years now within the area and there are no reported non-fatal casualties for the period. Um, and easily, you know, we remain low for comparable averages. Engagement with our community members to deliver appropriate fire safety messages will always be a proactive operating model. In effecting a positive engagement model, we reach those most vulnerable in our communities early and working with partners to seek and improve safety within the home. For deliberate fires, there's only one recorded instance, which is an outdoor fire in the scrub in November. No issues surrounding this incident, and again, for that particular area, it's quite common to have small outdoor fires there. Engagement's been carried out by the station commander for the area, and as we progress into the coming year across schools and communities, to provide guidance to those who may not realise the outcomes and the potential effects of lighting outdoor fires. Um, as you'll know, we're now into Muirburn season, and we've had one fire down in Argyll and Butte area. So my my consideration is that that will start to appear shortly. Special service RTCs. We had no recorded RTCs over the reporting period. Unwanted fire alarm signals. These continue to be well below comparable averages and no issues for the local area. Premises will continue to be monitored and we repeat instances are impacted on service delivery as well as meeting SFRS guidance for breach, breach of breach engagement Sorry, breach engagement will be implemented to identify cause and seek appropriate solutions with the duty holders. So station availability. This remains one of the most challenging aspects of SFRS on call business model within remote, rural remote areas with the significant societal changes. We continue to proactively recruit and I can tell you that there are five going away uh, in the next week or so who will go to stations throughout the area uh, with an, an, another significant number in the recruitment uh, um, system. Um, 
national options are being sought which will be adopted to support a stronger and more effective recruiting model and working in with some of those as well which i can update you on Fort william continues to be the highest performer station supporting outlying stations and areas within the community the Ardemarkin peninsula is actually improving at a steady pace with a few new starts and potential recruits we're seeing an improvement particularly in the article um we're seeing Loch Allen's coming on a little bit more uh, Kilhone is going to be a little bit better because they've got one coming in and Strontians where we need to focus on our, our energies. Malig performs to a very high standard considering that it's at half establishment and we do struggle at the moment to get recruits there. Alternative response models are also now being considered and following evaluations may be implemented where suitable. We're currently running some of these models in Sky um, but there are risk assessments and processes that have to be followed around that. And then finally, I'm pleased to report there will be a new station commander moving into the role of district commander following uh, the retirement of the incumbent. Colin Robb will retire on February the 7th and Shay Scott will replace him. He's an experienced station commander from Royal Berkshire. Um, very, very diligent, very dedicated, innovative and very keen to, to put his stamp on the area. So uh, he will bring experience, innovation and enthusiasm to position. So that concludes my report for today and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, Mike, it's Angus McDonald. Um, um, at the um, Highland Council meeting, the last Highland Council meeting, one of the members raised an issue that you had to have four um, firemen before a, um, a fire engine could be sent to a job. And it was universally agreed by the councillors that this was unacceptable. Um, and um, because if, if your baby was stuck in the top floor and three farmen were watching and wouldn't come to help, that was clearly completely unacceptable. And that they were asked, or the, the leader was asked to go and engage at the top of the fire service and to put across our views. Have you heard anything about this? And what's your personal opinion on this? And do you think we can remedy it? I have spoken. <coughs> I was at a Kilhome Community Council meeting and this came up and they agreed that they thought it was accept unacceptable as well. OK, thank you, Councillor. So first and foremost, um, I'm aware of that conversation. Um, what I would say is that there's a lot of political ramifications around that in the northwest corner of the Highlands and this is where it's been driven from. We actually have that happening on Sky at the moment as well due to the lack of resources in the staffing establishments. So we've implemented joint mobilising pro pro uh, protocols in certain areas where we're really struggling. Um, we have under what we call our grey book conditions from the union and we have to follow that um, as a national and not just Scottish, but that's UK wide agreement for a certain amount of it of firefighters have to come out because if somebody's trapped in a building, you're absolutely right. If and, and I'll, I'll put this back to you because my priority is rescue and save life, but it's also protect firefighter safety. So you'll have seen in Jenner's what's happened recently yesterday. So we have the situations where somebody looks at a situation and goes, that's a small domestic building. There's a fire in there and we turn up with a crew of two or three. And we, we need to commit to BA. We need somebody outside who can do that management of it, the water supply, dealing what else is going on around them. And the spans of control become untenable. And then we've got two chaps or girls in BA inside trying to deal with something without any communications and if anything goes wrong the situation escalates terribly so there's a terribly hard balancing act there I, I can't give you my personal opinions because nationally it has been discussed between highland council and uh, ross Hager, our chief fire officer um that's ongoing and will be the the, the, the mobilizing process that we're putting in place where we've said for example betty hill and tongue they're often at three and three so we're getting them to meet up and we're getting them to go as one full appliance or maybe a couple to back them up as well. So we're looking at models like that that does happen. Now, I have actually authorised that in Ardemarkin and Kilhoan area, and I believe I would need to speak to Rosie, but I think Rosie's gone out before with three and we've risk assessed it, knowing that we've got another appliance en route. We're even taking decisions where we'll say on Sky, um, we'll mobilise one to start heading 
then we'll time it to mobilise the other so the two coincide at the same time. The problem that you need to recognise then is, do we put them off the run on the way back in case they pick up another incident? So there's a lot of variables around this. Our priority will and always will be to protect our communities and we will do everything in our power to do so. We cannot, however, put our firefighters beyond an unacceptable level of risk because not only will that jeopardise their lives, that will bring legal implications as well. So there's there's a lot to be discussed around that. If I'm being perfectly frank, we need to recruit more people and we don't have the people coming to us these days that we used to have. You could you used to be able to bat them away with a, with a stick because you had more than enough. You could pick and choose. They're coming in dribs and drabs. So we're looking at alternative recruitment models that we think will make a difference to that. But this is not just Scotland. This is if you were for, if you were to speak to them in Devon and Cornwall and Wales, I've spoken to few in Wales, they're having exactly the same problems. And it's predominantly largely tourist areas whereby housing has been affected and um, young families have moved on to other areas. Um, the, <clears throat> the demand by primary employers is significantly higher than it has been and they won't release them because uh, there's there's certain competition between why should they be released and paid so i i'm not trying to I, make I, excuses I, 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 but I, I understand i understand this i just if the population knew this was the case they would be very upset about it okay so i'm just passing that on I, i've no, been spoken no. to by a very senior person in your in, in one of the well ahead of one of your fire stations here who said even if we had one person and there was a fire in that town they would go to rescue they would not let people die but it is it was it was quite a strong meeting um at the highland council anyway i think we should move on no, but it's, and, it's, and, and angus it's i will say that to you and in, in poor tree i did have an instance where two of the firefighters were going to a person's reported to assist and do what they could because you need to remember first and foremost they are community members anyway they live and breathe in these communities so i absolutely get their passion and it's up to people like me who have to balance that act and say, let me get the best result I can for everybody. We will never ever reduce our service where we can, and we will always attend, always attend, and we will maximise that however we can do so. And, and I hope that gives you some reassurance, but it is going to go on, and it's probably going to be a discussion for quite a period of time um, until we get to a better position or a different m operating model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Good morning. Uh, I just want to talk about is there anything we can do uh, as councillors to help uh, uh, with the recruitment or how the council can do? Uh, I particularly notice uh, 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 difficulty in recruiting female uh, uh, fighters. Is there a reason? Uh, is it specific to this area? In the rest of Scotland, in the rest of the country. Um, is there anything again we can do as the Highland Council to, to help? Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, funny you should say that, but I've got about four females going into uh, Kinloch Leaven, uh, with a couple already there. So some stations do far better there. Fort William, for example, has only got one female. Um, and we only get males applying, which is a peculiar thing because I have asked that question. Um, you then go elsewhere across the area. Strontian's got a couple of females. Um, Loch Allen's got um, Rianne down there and, and, and we were going to hire another one, but she didn't pass the fitness. So I don't think there's a, I don't think there's an issue per se around female recruiting female firefighters. Um, we are very much an open and diverse service now and it's that message has been well received across our whole time and our on call um i think that other other limitations on females being able to join due to different demands which men may not have that's maybe a question for a different you know a different venue um i certainly spend a lot of time with my teams asking them to make sure they're looking and seeing what they can do and we will take on we will take on male female I'm absolutely happy to do so, no problem at all. Um, I don't think there's an issue for us as an organisation, um, and I think that some of our female firefighters are going to turn into absolutely wonderful officers at some point in the future, um, because they're very different to our male firefighters um, and give a very different approach and how they, they, they work through the organisation. 
So what I would say is in Highland Council, maybe it's worth us having those conversations, you know, when I'm on that community planning partnership dots there today of what can Highland Council contribute towards that promotion of the recruitment process. Can we do it through social media? Can Highland Council proactively support us? Um, you know, we're 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 not we're not being standoffish at all. Derek Wilson, the LSO previously, he engaged fully with um, Highland Council and discussed all aspects and all areas that we could do, particularly in that northwest corner. Um, and they spent an awful lot of time up there trying to deal with that. Um, and then Michael that's in there now, Michael Humphreys, again, he, he's he's very keen to work together. So any partnership approach that can improve our recruitment for any female or male firefighter is absolutely something I will support. Thank you. Um, do we have no questions online? I think. Um, oh, John. <coughs> Yes, sorry. Morning, Mike. Sorry. Good morning. Play, playing with cameras and microphones. Um, I, I have asked this question before at an earlier meeting we've had with the fire service. Um, because of where I stay, I'm very aware that Fort Augustus gets involved in quite a lot of the fires and the call outs within our area. Um, I'm not sure how much they contribute. Um, so uh, in terms of your report, I, I accept it's it's inclusive, it's very good and it's about Loch Abba, but it feels like for me in order to get the picture, I really need to know a little bit about Fort Augustus and how they're linking in and maybe even Inverness and how they actually link into some of the incidents in the area. OK, so, so I'm going to take and so I'll take a note of your name there, Councillor, um, because there's a different station commander runs that and different aid group commander. So right. that runs under what we call our Highland Central. So as far as I'm aware, there should be a report that is then provided to the scrutiny committee for that area that covers um, Fort Augustus, Drumnadrocha, um, and across that way. Um, so what we should be getting is you involved in that meeting. I don't know if you attend that at this moment in time. Not currently, no. No, OK, so let me let me have a look into that for you. Um, you're absolutely right. Fort Augustus is one of our backup stations and comes across um, on a regular occurrence, mm -hmm. not only here, but to the Sky and West, uh, Sky and um, um, Lochalsh area as well. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Elizabeth that's there, uh, I work very closely with her in her capacity as an on-call support watch commander. She's a very, very good individual. Um, so she's going to be back in there full time in her station. So I, I work very closely with her in regards to that. But Bruce looks after that area, so I will check and see if we can get you on there, and then you can have those conversations about Fort Augustus directly. And I remember we did speak about this, um, rather than dropping into this and, and not getting any feedback from me because I can't I can't give you any comment yeah. on Fort Augustus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. No problem. Thanks, thanks, John. Just um, a final question. Um, I going back to the fact we're in the mule burning season and may potentially be dry periods coming up before the end of the season. So my understanding is that the, that anyone doing a mule burn is supposed to is supposed to report to the fire service first. Is that correct? So if if a mule burn does happen and they haven't reported this and then even worse, if it gets out of control, what are the you know, what is the process for unreported mule burn? So thank you, Chair. Um, and you're absolutely correct. They should report these in. Should uh, a fire be started deliberately, that's when we, we would then say this is a deliberate ignition, that would then go to Police Scotland. And Police Scotland and ourselves would work together to identify the route um, for it, um, who potentially had started that fire. Um, we tend to get a significant number down towards Malig, um, over a, a, an area down there, excluding Glenfinnan, um, because that unfortunately is a lot of accidental ones. But any muir burn, you're absolutely right, has to be reported. Should it be a case of a deliberate fire that we identify, Police Scotland will take that on board and working with our legislative team, there'll be conversations had with the duty holders at that point, the, the landowners, crofters, um, and should it become a repeat occurrence, then prosecutions can be had. Um, I don't know if there has been a prosecution at any point, but we did have one that we were looking at quite closely um, for in 20, 
21, we were looking at it very, very closely to the point that it may have been a potential prosecution. And it'll be interesting to see because it was quiet last year as to whether we get an increase this year in that one again. OK. okay. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, when we when members of the public see Muirburn happening, obviously we don't know whether it's been reported beforehand or not. Is it worth, you know, is it a good idea just to let the fire service know or is it only when they suppose it, you know, get out of control? What is the process for that as well? Well, well that's what I'm saying, Chair, that they are, as soon as they start to light a fire, they are supposed to phone our operations control and advise them that we're doing that. So then when a member of the public phones in, they're advised, no, we're aware of that. It's an ongoing fire. It's not out of control at this point. When it then, say, for example, and I've had them myself, it starts to cover smoke across the road or impinge upon property. That's when then it gets dealt with that we attend. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's culturally, it's, it's there to be done. It's been done for, for generations um, and we, we'll have to allow them that opportunity to do the mirror burn. Um, the only thing that we may potentially have an issue with this year, and just to put on your radar, is that we are balloting for industrial action. Um, we do not know the outcome of that yet, but what I ha can tell you is that predominantly our whole time personnel will probably be out the door, um, and our on call, the majority, and I know the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland, for example, have all said that they will remain in their communities and continue to service their communities. What I may mean is how we resource and balance and do things going forward. But um, that doesn't happen, I believe, until 23rd of February, potentially. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you okay. for that. Yeah. Um, any, I think, is that all questions? Well, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you um, recover quickly. Thank you very much. OK, take care, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye-bye yeah. now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So item four on the agenda is the Area Roads Capital Programme. And hello to Richard Porteous, Roads Operation Manager. Um, thank you for joining us, Richard. Thanks, Chairman, members. Yes, yeah, so this is the... Uh, Area Roads Capital Programme for 2023-24. Um, we've spoken about this uh, at uh, board business meetings and, and other meetings previously. So uh, draw your attention to section uh, five in the report and the table 5.1, which, which summarises the position that um, other than the baseline capital funding, uh, is there's no confirmation yet. Um, until it's agreed at uh, full council uh, whether we'll get any additional capital money next year or not. So um, the report outlines how we determine the priorities for capital spending on the roads maintenance programme uh, and uh, the schemes um, highlighted through our scheme builder uh, programmes which combines the Scottish Road Maintenance Condition Survey results um basically scoring the roads uh, on a, on a, on an assessment um that's contained in appendix 2 um so how how much of that work, work we can get done will depend on on the capital allocation that we receive um so it will usually be spent either on surface dressing uh, which is a thin covering of the road surface which extends the road life by about 10 years and is relatively cheap to do. So spread a stitch in time spending, which uh, spreads the money as far as we can as well. Or it's more expensive surfacing operation, which is uh, sort of roughly four inch uh, new tar covering, which is far more expensive. So the money doesn't go so far. But if the road is in a really bad condition, then that's what we require to do. We, we also some of the capital allocation may be a, a sort of HQ allocation, which will be allocated to areas based on the priority needs. So we may get some some uh, strategic capital, as they call it, as well. And if we do at the moment, that's that's probably going to be targeted onto the A884, where there's some some surfacing schemes that we we still wish to get to there. Um, 
for that being the, the surfacing being the expensive option. So surface dressing at the moment, it looks like uh, well, one of the things we need to do with surface dressing rather than just protect the um, roads that we've highlighted for treatment, it's also to protect areas that have been surfaced in the past to reduce the oxidization process and, and protect that new new surface. So there's there's sections um, of a previously surfaced road that we, we want to protect as well with surface dressing. So at the moment, the surface dressing is, is, is looking like uh, our priorities would be on the A884, uh, the B8043 King Gerloch Road, and also some sections of the B849 Drimnin Road. Um, so that, that's just some examples of the priorities uh, we're, we're focusing on at the moment. But what, what we will definitely do once we uh, get clarity on the on the capital that's available to us, which will then allow us to, to fine tune the, the program, we'll, we'll bring that to uh, members at ward business meeting um, and keep you fully, fully involved in the in the process. So meantime, this report is really highlighting the 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 uh, priority areas that are, have been identified and uh, asking members to to approve that um, pending um, further information on, on the capital available to us after the main Highland Council capital programme is agreed, which is at the beginning of February. So uh, the report itself is quite self-explanatory, I think, so just probably go back to the chair and ask members if they have any, any particular questions. I, I'm also aware of some background noise in my office because there's some work being done here, but I, I don't think my mic's picking it up. But if it is, please let me know. Thanks. No, I, th I don't think it is, Richard. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. And does, do we have any questions? I think Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, Richard. Good to see you. Um, just a question. Regarding uh, the length, uh, if I could do Appendix 1 in um, the Area Capital Program Roads Budget Allocation. The harbour, uh, the total road length is 670 miles, uh, kilometres, sorry. I had a look at other areas with nearly the similar mileage. Uh, Caseness, just a bit more, and Sky, just a bit less. So very comparable, but as soon as we go into the winter allocation, there is a big difference. Um, if you look at uh, the winter allocation, and, and I can't find it on the, uh, yes, I can find it. So it's 339 three, in Le Havre, but as soon as you go to Caseness, it's 525. Five. Sorry to interrupt, uh, councillors, uh, chairman. It's just typical. Uh, somebody's drilling a big hole in the wall behind me, and uh, I couldn't hear a word you were saying. I'm going to have to go and ask them to, to stop. Uh, if you bear with me for one second. Thank you very much. Great question. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to pick on that. My money's on it being because. Badnock and Strasbourg gets a hell of a lot more snow than we do, and, and Keith Ness as well. But I'll just throw that in there. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ooh, I can hear myself think now. Sorry to have to okay. ask you to repeat the, the question. Yeah, no problems. So basically, um, Appendix 1 in the roads budget allocation, I looked at the <coughs> Uh, the total road length, which is 670 kilometres. Uh, and I looked at other areas with nearly a similar sort of uh, length. So Caithness, uh, 161, just a bit more. And Sky, just a bit less. That's the nearest I could find. Very close. I mean, I would say the difference is 5, 10% in terms of length. But as soon as you go into the winter allocation, the difference is huge. 339.563 uh, uh, for Le Havre. Uh, when you go to Caithness, it's 525. It's a big difference. Same with Sky, 557. Why is there such a big difference? They're getting probably something like 80% more than we get, whereas they've got the, the total road length is very much the same. Why such a difference? Okay, um, the reasons. 
every area of the Highlands has has a different microclimate, and uh, so the budget allocation um, tends to be um, as a result of that, because because more uh, some areas will require more treatments than others. Uh, that that's one reason, but the the other reassurance there is um, the cyclical maintenance budget in our revenue budget and the winter maintenance budget are kind of mutually exclusive. Um, the bottom line is determined by road length. So if you if you look at the bottom line figures for re, uh, the revenue budget, uh, you will see that it's it's proportionate to to the road length. But the the way it's divvied up between cyclical maintenance and winter maintenance varies around the highlands and purely because of the a the weather and also b um, the number of primary routes, secondary routes, and other routes, and the distribution across the areas. But the reassurance is that if more requires to be spent on winter, because an area, say like Loch Aber, which if it has got a proportionately lower winter maintenance budget, if it requires to spend more winter maintenance, more revenue on winter maintenance that year, then we, it will that will be done, <laughs> because we can't be doing winter maintenance when we're doing other cyclical work so the cyclical spend reduces and the winter maintenance spend goes up but uh, the bottom line is proportionate across the whole of the highlands hope that made sense thank you any other questions no i think um we'll let you off the hook richard <laughs> Thank you very much for. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I was just going to. Sorry, I was just. It was just a quick question, Richard. Um, I, I used to see the jet patcher in action from time to time, and it and it gave a really good, resilient, if not very beautiful, repair of the road surface. But it certainly seemed to be quite a tough repair. And we've got the JCB Pro now. I was just going to ask you, like, could you give us a wee bit of feedback? And how is the JCB Pro? How, What's your thoughts on it? Has, is it? I was reading that it was supposed to be able to do five or six times the amount of repairs for the same amount of money. How has it worked? And would it be possible to maybe go and see it in action somewhere? Yes, it'd be no problem to go and see it in action. It's worked well. Um, it's a relatively expensive piece of kit, so it's something that we want to um, be as uh, well utilised as possible to make the best use of that asset. Obviously, it's a, an extra cost to, to maintain that asset. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting best value out of it. But yes, it has been it has been very productive, and obviously, but obviously, it requires to be manned with a with a squad, and and other equipment, uh, lorries, uh, particularly to go with it. Um, but yeah, it, it, we we tried to work it. It was relatively new to us last year, so we tried to be. Involved uh, training, training up the guys, and then making as best use of it as we could, and and we did manage to uh, get good productivity out of it last year. So we'll be planning to do the same again this year. Uh, the the jet patcher, yeah, um, w there's a question mark w whether we will use the jet patcher this year. It has been very effective in previous years, and as you say, the the finish can vary. Um, the last thing we want is this sort of rippled effect that you can sometimes get, which creates it's like traffic calming rather than uh, neat patching. Um, but if it's done well, it, it, it's it's an efficient uh, way of covering a lot of ground, and it, it's uh, as good as a permanent repair in in some sections. But if you use it on a bend, which is getting uh, uh, vehicles screwing around on the bend, and they they will sometimes push the material out out of the hole. But on a, on a, on other sections, it's it's a very appropriate uh, repair, and and we can cover a lot of ground with it and make a big difference. And it, and it and it's just kind of, it doesn't just fill the hole; you you seal the edges, so you're stopping water ingress. So it, it is quite a, an effective uh, repair. Um, but uh, if if we have the the baseline capital allocation next year, it's it's. It's quite likely that we won't use the jet patcher this year. We'll try to maximise um, our spending on surface dressing, and, and and equally, if we don't have a, a big enough allocation, what we'll probably do is focus on a lot of 
rather than long sections sections of surfacing, which we we won't be able to afford, uh, we'll look at targeting and trying to achieve best value with the money that we've got, and a series of la more like large patches. There'll be short surfacing sections, but uh, how you define them as a large patch or a short short bit of surfacing, it's it's a bit arbitrary and it'll depend uh, site by site. But that'll be the tend to be the approach if we, if we have limited funds next year. Okay, that's great. I'll maybe just come out one day and have a wee look at the, the JCB Pro in action just to see it going. But thanks for that. <clears throat> thanks, Thomas. I think Andrew had your hand yeah. up. <clears throat> hi, Rich. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, Richard. Um, just two two things really. One um, is are we are we seeing typical levels of damage across this winter, roadwise? Mm -hmm. And two, living on a C-class road um, out here in Invergary, which is subject to a lot of heavy wear from the likes of SSE and so on, doing construction work, is suffering uh, greatly and is clearly inadequate. Promises were made about increasing passing places and so on. Have you got any idea where... The council stands in enforcing possible agreements that they might have made in planning conditions and that that kind of issue. It's a bit of a big question that one, but go, go for the winter damage first. Thanks. Uh, winter. Uh, the worst thing for the road is 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 the wet. Uh, water on the road gets forced into cracks uh, by by traffic and heavy vehicles and uh, you know then burst the surface yeah. uh, creating potholes more water gets in and, and it's a it's a downward spiral then uh, mm -hmm. so yeah w so drainage in particularly in Loch Aber is really really important it, it doesn't so it doesn't have to be obviously the freeze thaw action compounds that when you, mm -hmm. you get ice in into these in these holes uh, so we're not, we are at this stage of the winter, you'll, you'll start to see uh, potholes appearing and uh, road edge uh, uh, holes as well, where the, the edge is, the road's breaking up. So yeah, it's not, not a typical winter at the moment, I would say, it's just pretty average. Um, but we, we have had a lot of freeze thaw and we have had a lot of wet weather. So you, mm. there will be a lot of damage becoming uh, evident at, at the moment. Um, hopefully that answers that question. The other one about the um, Invergar, was it the Invergari road that you're talking yeah, about there? Yeah, we're on <clears throat> the Tom Down Road. The... Oh yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'll have to refresh my memory about development that's taking place up there if there is development taking place then that is an opportunity often to for improvement if we can mm -hmm. capture um capture uh capture that in the section 96 agreement for example or a um or some, some other agreement like that so where we can uh yeah that can be a condition of the of the the agreement is that we get an, an improvement to the road <clears throat> SSE are, are replacing the, the power lines out to Sky. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Well, well, I can come back to you after this meeting, if you like, once we've Good talked to colleagues oh. about that. Yeah, Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. No problem. <clears throat> Thank you. I think, and Sarah, you've got a question. Thank you. Uh, um, Richard, uh, uh, do we have any updates regarding what's happening on the route to Kielahoe, and uh, I'm thinking of uh, um, Tamasnagor, where there have been some sort of mini landslide and rocks falling on the road. And I would extend that to the rest of the harbour and the highlands. Um, with climate change and more and more heavy rain, uh, are we facing more scenarios, a bit like rest and be thankful, but lots of uh, similar scenarios around the highlands with essential small roads like the, the one to kill home, you know, that could be closed for weeks, denying access to some communities. Is it something that is likely to increase to happen more and more? Thank you. I, oh, I'm in, I keep a 
keen watch on all the, the, the science around climate change, but uh, I couldn't give a definitive answer on that. But uh, we we have always had issues in Loch Haber with uh, landslips. Um, the last really big one was at Loch Coich uh, about three years ago, um, where the dam was nearly uh, wiped out by a huge landslip. Um, and that affected the power line to, to sky as well. Um, other than that, we've we've had a few um, uh, smaller ones, which we've we've been able to deal with in in area. But yeah, it's something that uh, the the wet weather is the issue, as you said, and um, we get a lot of that in the west. So it's it's always been an issue for us. Whether it's getting worse, I, I don't know. But obviously, we're we're keeping a close eye on on that. Um, sorry, was there a second part to that question? I, Sorry to have to ask again. Uh, the, the, first, the first part was just uh, the updates on uh, Campus McGraw, the, the route to Kilowen. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we're 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 in. There's potential to spend vast amount of money on uh, net systems to protect uh, the travelling public below the hillside there, where there's a lot of loose rock further up. So there's, there's potential to spend a lot of money there. So we've been talking with colleagues in HQ. Um, you know, you're talking potentially f f yeah, five million pounds worth of work. So we're looking at ways that we can, if that money's not available in, in one uh, one hit, which is highly unlikely, then um, ways that we can target uh, and prioritize the sections there and, and do some every year, uh, stage by stage, uh, uh, spending smaller amounts each year. So that's the latest thinking on that one. And uh, it's looking like we'll have to yeah, go out of the area and tap into HQ funding for that. Thanks. Thank you. I think yep, we have some questions done. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, look forward to that. Oh, and sorry, sorry the, um, so we've just been asked to approve the 2023-24 um, Area Roads Capital Programme for Lock Arbor. Are we all in approval? Yep, looks like it. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chair, members. See you soon. Bye, Richard. Yeah, Richard. Thank Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so item five is the Lock Arbor um, HRA capital program report. And we've got Jonathan Henderson, housing investment officer, joining us to um, present the report. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Chair, and good, good morning, members. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a quick introduction to the, the report, if that's OK. Um, just highlight a couple of sections. Um, section five of of the the report um, outlines the 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 current year um, HRA capital program 22 to 23. It gives a, a, an update on that, along with uh, Appendix one, um, which goes into more um, more detail um, about the specific projects which are ongoing at the moment. Um, section five. Uh, sorry, section six. Um, the main the main body of the report really um, the 23 to 27 um, HRA capital programme for Loch Aber. Um, we go into a bit of detail there about the process um, we've gone through to, to develop uh, the recommendations for, for the future programme. Members will note in Appendix 2 that we, we are recommending a fairly balanced programme uh, for Loch Aber um, for, for the four year period. However, there is a, a, a focus um, and a priority um, recommended around energy efficiency works um, in our stock, um, along with um, the continued um, allocation members will note for aids and adaptations work, um, which uh, ho hopefully allows people to stay in their homes um, a, a wee bit longer. So um, I didn't intend to go into um, in any more detail than that by way of introduction, but but certainly happy to um, pick up um, any questions that members may have. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Do we have questions from anyone? Angus. Um, Jonathan, do you, uh, how far are we um, through the process of double glazing windows or energy efficiency or 
um, giving people some sort of heating which is suitable for today. I mean, are we are we ten percent or eighty percent? I've just no idea from these numbers. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's an ongoing process in terms of the the improvements that we that we have to make in our stock and. Um, when we met at Ward Business um, just before Christmas, um, we spoke briefly about the energy efficiency standard for um, social housing. Um, and I'm, I'm actually um, in the process of organising a, a further attendance at La Cabra Ward Business to go into that in, in more detail um, and, and look specifically specifically at that. But um, the, the programme in front of you just now obviously having that priority around uh, energy efficiency works allows us to continue the work um, um, towards that. So I don't have um, specific figures um, to, today for Look Aber, but let's leave it. Um, we'll, leave it. we'll leave it for now. We can we can pick that up later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. And um, Andrew. I think um, I think it was largely the same subject, really. It was going back to the the previous meeting, uh, Jonathan, where I was disturbed. I think the figure was 41% of our housing stock, if I'm on the right track, um, was were energy levels E and F, which I think we all agreed around the table at the time was was really poor. Um, and I just wanted to know what our what our route forward might be but i think you said you said you're going to come back on that one so we'll we'll, we'll let that drop for now for the moment i think chair and thomas hand up thanks um in section 6.2 um the guideline principles within the 2022-27 hra capital plan were as follows it says a life cycle based approach to major components component replacement which targets a replacement of kitchens, bathrooms, windows and doors based on their last installation date recorded in the housing information system. Is, is this a complete kind of sea change by the council in that they're now adopting a component accounting structure? Because up till now in the last 20 years I've, I've basically witnessed firefighting and the um, arguments over whose kitchens and bathrooms are getting replaced and everything. So are we now going to have a structured component accounting system put in place? It'll take years to, to actually come to pass, but is that the way the council's heading? Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor. We, we've, <clears throat> Section 6.2 um, is, is the the guiding principle which we followed um, for, for quite a few years now in terms of trying to prioritise um, the installations that that we need to carry out with the resources that we have, but we are um, in the process over the next while um, of of focusing in a bit more on an asset management based approach. We've got a new um, service lead um, for repairs and investment, Rory McLeod, um, who probably would like to come along toward business alongside me um, the next time, um, just to go into that in a bit more detail. But um, as I say, section six point two is the is the principle or are the principles that we followed now for for a good while. Um, in order to try and use the information that we've got um, to prioritise the oldest installations um, uh, that that we have, um, I hope that um, goes some way to answer your question. But again, I'm more than happy to pick that up in, in more detail um, at at the future work business that I've that I've referenced. Well, Jonathan, that, that's great. Like as I said, I've been here before, and I, I was always asking for this to be the way that we dealt with things, like. Um, Housing associations have gone down that route for a long time. Where they, you, whether you need the new kitchen or not, if it's twenty-five years, you're getting the new kitchen, and that's it. Whereas we just, it's our whole structure as regards a lots of things at the council. It just seems to boil down to how good councillors are about arguing to get resources for their particular patch. And I'm delighted to see that component accounting is actually now becoming standard practice within Highland Council. And the second part, because did, did somebody say you've got a remit within investment? Um, Councillor, it's really just that's the, uh, my, my title as Housing right. Investment Officer, right. so it's really just, um, I, I suppose, identifying what, what we need to do. Okay. Um, it, it was just one of the things I was going to ask you. Like, Highland Council and all councils, we're now back in the business of building 
council housing, you know, in, in the last whatever it be, six, seven years, Highland Council has built hundreds of houses all over the Highlands. And we're going down, building houses that are very efficient. And then we clad them with that exterior insulation. Is there any kind of, um, basically we build a brand new house in the estate and it looks lovely day one, but within two or three years, it looks so tatty, you'd think it was 20 or 30 years old because of the staining that's occurred. Is there any scope anywhere within the council that we actually make that a priority and give people an environment that they're proud of to live in? Because we're building brand new buildings that look absolutely awful within a few short years. And I think it should be a council priority that we actually basically give people something to be proud of in, in their home and that it's kept looking smart and tidy. Have you got any thoughts on what we can do about that? Thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose one aspect of the of the programme um, that members would be um, hopefully familiar with, and certainly if not, uh, more so over the over the coming attendance at, at our businesses, just the the proportion of the budget which we allocate for um, environmental works, <clears throat> which allows us to have a a local discussion um, with with members with tenants. Um, and with the local team about what the priorities um, need to be in these in these specific local areas, connected to that, and and again, it's 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 something which I'm sure, if if not um, in recent times, but certainly due to come, is uh, some rate your estate walk arounds um, in in the local areas to identify um, specific priorities um, within the the local communities that that we that we need to look to look to prioritise. Sorry, um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, just could I just come in one more time? Um, yep. I just think it's a problem that we need to look at as a council because the ramifications of not giving people a home to be proud of the society are felt in all kinds of ways, vandalism and just uh, there's lots of issues that come from it. But if if I could just say a specific housing development, Fort William High Street, the far end of the High Street, Tweeddale. Six years ago, we spent two and a half million pound doing up, I think about 20 odd flats and um, they look really tatty now. And I'm really disappointed because I've been in the flats. They're, they're amazing flats inside, they really are. But it's incredible how tatty it's got in such a short space of time. And uh, I would like to maybe ask for a report to come back from Highland Council on what we're doing about keeping new build houses at least looking good but also maintaining them properly but at the very least keeping them looking smart for longer. And I'm sorry to bog the meeting down about it but it's something I think we all feel strongly about. Thanks, Councillor. Um, with regard to that specific example, I can certainly pick that up with the uh, with the local team. Um, happy to speak to Lachie McDonald, um, the repairs manager, and and um, ask him to come back to um, come back to you directly, just with some um, some comments on that, um, if that's okay. Um, my point was exactly the same and exactly the same building. You know, we're all about improving Fort William, and if you drive past Fort William, you look at the back of our new council building, and you're embarrassed. But we raised this six months ago at a council meeting. Um, I can't remember who was going to come back to us, but the answer is Robertson's built it, and it is not fit for purpose, and it's, it's a shocker. And I, we really appreciate you coming back to us on this one. Thanks, Thank Councillor. Just to just to repeat, yeah, um, I'll I'll pick that up with the uh, with the local team specifically, Lachie, and um, ensure to sure to come back to you. Thank you. Um, so we there were three items to note and to um, agree the proposed investment priorities in the um, housing revenue account capital program for Lock Arbor from 2023 to 27, as set out in Appendix Two. So um, are we all in agreement? Indeed, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Agreed. Okay. Great. Thank you. So item four as well. Sorry, what's that? You've got item four as well. Um, and to note the updates in the um, in the capital pro housing revenue account capital program. 
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Alistair, for joining us, okay. and um, we will see you mm. again. Jonathan. Thank you. Jonathan. Jonathan, you. Oh, did, did I say yeah. Jonathan? <laughs> Um, so moving on to item six, the housing revenue account um, garage rents for 2023-24. And we've got um, David Wood joining us, the principal housing officer. So good morning, David, and thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Morning, members. Good morning, David. Good morning. Yeah, morning. Thank you very much. I, I think okay. you're going to um, just take us through the report, and we've got um, we've been we're having needing to agree a level of rent increase. That that's correct. Um, firstly, apologies that the author of the report, Sandra McLennan, can't be here today. Unfortunately, she's not very well, so um, that's why I'm going to present it to you today. You you will all have had a copy of the HRA garage report. So my intention is not to go over it word for word, but hopefully I'll I'll um, I'll cover the salient points. So if we start with the background. Members agreed an extensive action plan in August 2019, a plan that covered several years using a red amber green system. And this is the plan that we continue to work through at the moment. Appendix one at the back of the report offers a full update on where we are with this just, just currently. Um, last year, February 2022, members agreed a 1% increase for uh, rents for garages and garage sites. If we quickly look at the current income, in the current financial year, there are 114 garages and 112 garage sites which generated an income of £88,085.28 as illustrated in Table <clears> 5.1. In addition to the 226 units mentioned, there are 23 garages in Clark Drive in Corpoch, which can't be let due to their poor condition, unfortunately. They've been closed on the housing system, essentially to avoid the accumulation of void loss. In terms of occupancy levels, Table 5.3 illustrates there are 24 voids of the 226 units available. We recognise that the previously mentioned action plans improve the void loss considerably in the Lacarbor area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rental rates between council tenants and non-council tenants differs, as illustrated in Table 5.5. This is essential as VAT is chargeable to non-council tenants. The repairs budget for garages is £7,000 a year for day-to-day -day repairs. Any additional, any additional expenditure required uh, needs to be identified through either environmental or planned maintenance budgets. If we look at rent options, we would recommend a 7% increase for this year. And it's important to note that any additional revenue that this brings will be ring fence for garage repairs and improvements. Table 6.3 illustrates, for your information and consideration, income that would be generated at a 3, 5 and 7% increase. And if we touch on the action plan, the action plan that was agreed by the members in August 2019 continues to move forward in line with the recommendations outlined in 7.2 of the report. 14 of the previous red amber categories have now been moved to green, which is quite impressive, I think. To date, we've demolished five garage rows and identified one site that has development potential. And overall, feedback from residents has been very, very positive. That really concludes the report. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions you have in relation to that. Um, so if, if you have any questions, please feel free. Okay. Do we have questions before we um, decide on the increase to the garage rents? 
Angus. Um, David, um, I, I know what's happening in the other areas across the Highlands uh, because um, there's a WhatsApp group where these things are shared. Uh, um, our decisions, presumably, on council house rent increases, we have, we don't make up our mind for Lock Harbour, do we? Do you know? No. Yeah, we we agree. So, we agree at a local level. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, we do. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I think that what's happening in the other areas is they're trying to agree this as, a, as the same match to go with council houses across the Highlands. And I think um, I think that 5% is what it seems to be what is happening across the Highlands. Um, it said 4 or 5% most likely for council houses, but 4% being recommended is what this correspondence is saying. So and just to get get that out there. Yeah, I think I think if you look at the reports and the tables, the 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 rents for garages and garage sites um, is quite considerably lower than council house properties. The additional revenue that we would we would like will enable us to redevelop them or or demolish or as as the plan determines once we investigate each particular kind of site which I think is why we're, we're really asking or requesting a 7% increase is what we'd recommend. Obviously, the, the choice is yours, but that's really why we would like the additional revenue because it will be it will be ploughed back in solely to the garages and garage sites. Do we have any other questions? John Grafton. Oh, and John, Tom. and then Thomas. John first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm I'm sort of curious in terms of the non-tenant garages. Um, who are they being rented to, and what effect does that have on the tenants? And supplementary to that question, would it be possible to increase the rents for non-tenants slightly more than the tenant rates? Thank you. The, the impact of, um, thanks for your, your question, Councillor Grafton. Um, the impact is negligible, really. Anyone can apply for a garage or a garage site. Um, it's always been the way we've never, they've never been exclusively for tenant usage. So that, that remains the situation. In terms of could we, could we levy a different level of rise on them? I think that's got to be your decision, but I I would think in in fairness, a, a, an agreed level across the board is the way to go, in in my personal opinion. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. Um, and Thomas, um, it was the Clark Drive ones. We've got twenty three voids there. Uh, is there any plans for that, David, to actually do something with these that area? So, thanks for that, Councillor McLennan. I thought you may pick up on this. Um, if you know the Clark Drive garages, yeah. they're actually in quite poor condition. Mm -hmm. the, the problem we've encountered with them is the, the way the structure lies. There's, there's an embankment immediately behind them, and there's a retaining wall um, that could cause issues. So because of their condition, we've deleted them from the system, although they, we still own them. There's no specific plans of what we will do with them yet. We've asked for, or I believe we've asked for a structural engineer's report as to the, the retaining wall and what the options are going to be with that. And then, of course, it's going to come down to cost as well once we've got that. And once we know that, then we'll be able to make a, a more kind of calculated decision on what's, what's going to happen with them. What I can say is the garages that we've demolished up to now has been received really well by the local residents. It's created a great deal of additional parking, which is always welcome. Mm -hmm. And aesthetically, the areas look far better. They look far more open and, and um, area, and people seem to appreciate this. But in direct answer to your question, that, that there's no specific plans of what's going to happen with the um, the Clark Drive garages as of yet. Okay. And then one other question: If somebody wanted 
I, I was asked this a few months ago by somebody who had a, a garage and I think they had the only garage in the area or, or, or one of very few. And he says, I'd like to buy it and, and do it up properly. Is That is not an option at all. That's not an option, I'm afraid, no. 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 OK. It's, it's not we, something we would consider at all. When you look at the like the figure of seven thousand pounds for day, day repairs, you the price of tradesmen nowadays you almost go well. I suppose per garage that'll that'll sort things out. But it's when you realise it's in totality, it, it's we've got very little money to do a lot of properties. Absolutely, and I think this this goes back to the earlier question of why we would recommend a seven percent increase just to generate a bit more revenue that we can put back in towards the garages and use it towards repair or demolition. OK, right, thanks. Um, thank you. I've just I've got a question in terms of the sites that where garages are being demolished and areas are being reserviced to improve parking issues. Would it be possible going forward? So in addition to the resurfacing for parking issues, if, say, for example, storage bike storage capacity could be put in um, for you know for people who are living in places where they they can't they have nowhere to store their bikes so is, is it possible that that could be a consideration going forwards where you know where garages are being demolished I, I thank you for that question I, I think it's I think it's a definite possibility it's something we would need to look at through our environmental budget but certainly if it's if it's it helps to improve the air and it's certainly what residents want, it's something we would certainly consider in moving forward. That would be fantastic. Perhaps we could yeah, follow up on that um, going forward, because I think you know we've got to encourage more use of bikes, and et cetera. Um, did I, Andrew, did you just put your yes, <clears throat> a little a little. Um, well, altruistic perhaps in a way um i was just going to suggest that there might be some space if garages are being demolished to erect some solar roofs which could uh, shelter cars certainly um and generate electricity um and there is some salex funding available uh from scottish government i think for uh and for energy generation in this kind of a matter Perhaps that's something you could look at, David, please. It, it's, uh, thank you for that, Councillor Baldry. It's, it's something we've not looked at that I'm aware of at this point, but I think it's it's food for thought and certainly something we can have a discussion around. Good, thank you. So are we... Um... Can I propose 5%, please? I think £600 a year is plenty for people on the phone. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that will forward. be your choice. Okay. So, um, any other? What do we? Can we? Can, can I propose five percent as well for tenants and uh, uh, slightly higher for uh, non-tenants? So would you be saying seven percent for non-tenants? What are the the admin the administration implications of this for? future discussion okay so that that we'd have to discuss that further <clears throat> one of my concerns long term is that if we put off tenants having a garage we could end up with more cars in uh, on the road uh, on the streets um, I think it's good that uh, some tenants rent a garage and use it to you know to park their car uh, we could have uh, more tenants actually not renting anymore in future. And uh, I'm just w worried about some implications. But also, I, I do think that 7%, you know, at the moment, the feeling I've ha I have talking to tenants is that 5% um, is sort of a rent increase. People are happy to be ready to accept 7%. So the garage is also a part of the rent for them on their budget. And 7% seems to me a bit too we will find it difficult to, to, to get support for that from that. So okay. I would look at 5% like Councillor MacDonald okay. for tenants and happy to 
make it a bit more for non-tenants. What, um, what, num what were the numbers that we're looking at in terms of non-tenants? Because I'm get it's going. It will be it, for the small number. The administration implications might be quite difficult. Would check with David if it's possible. Yeah, David, could we? What are the possibilities of this? I'm just, I'm just kind of having a look to see if I can see the actual numbers at the moment. Table five, it, it, five, it, it, five, it, five. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, item yeah, five, five of the reporters. Yeah, five, five is the table which will show you that. So. Which seems to say there's a lot more non tenants than there are tenants. Yeah. So for garages, 19 council tenants, non-tenants, 72. And on the garage sites, 20 council tenants and 91 non-council tenants. So that clearly identifies as more non-council tenants with garages and garage sites and tenants. My uh, my point is, if you are a, a garage rent a non tenant at fourteen pounds seventy three, you're paying at a seven at a five percent increase seven hundred and sixty five quid a year. I, I think that's quite a lot of money. Um, and probably they're not using it for the car; they're probably storing that's stuff. Strange. Certainly, I do. Um, I, I think five percent across the board is 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 plenty personally. But um, you know, I'll go for the majority. Yeah. I, I would. I would support 5% across the board. I will support 5% across the board because the tenants will be protected. Uh, yeah. That's right. okay. um, okay. If I could just say clearly, the tables within the report um, are obviously designed to illustrate the additional cost and, and revenue that would be generated. So clearly, that gives you the information that hopefully you feel comfortable with in recommending the the appropriate um rental increase yeah i'm uh, how about do we have agreement um councillors online i'm content to go along with that suggestion okay thanks thomas John and Andrew. Yeah, I, I think I'm content to go along with it. Um, I, I've heard David sort of talk about the money they need and the changes that that may, might make to the area in terms of the garages and garage sites. So I, I'm feeling a little bit split between the five and the seven percent. But yeah, I will certainly go along with the five percent. And then, and Liz, are you? Sorry, it keeps breaking up with me, but I'm quite happy to join in with the 5%. And in, um, in terms of revisions, would we be looking at um, a year, in a year's time, would we come back and revisit this? Yes, I think we, we yeah, we'd revisit in 12 months, I think. Yeah. Which is important to consider because if there's another increase in a year's time, say 5%, it will be 5% of that 5% instead of 5% of that 7%. It will, so yes. It keeps the, the increase more steady. I would, yeah, that's why I support 5%. Okay. Yep. So I think we've got um, a unanimous agreement on there that will agree a level of rent increase to be 5%. Okay. okay. And that's where. Thank you. Thank you. Have you got a question, Angus? No. Thank you very much for, for joining us, David. And have You're a very day. welcome. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Bye. 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 And we've got Matt Maria and Grisha. Yes. Can we, can, can we just have a quick um, a couple of minutes comfort break, please?
And then we'll be moving on to um, item seven on the agenda. Um, welcome back. So we're moving on to item seven on the agenda, which is the Community Regeneration Fund applications. And um, Marianne Gray, the project officer, has joined us this morning. Um, good morning, Marianne, and thank you for joining us. Good morning and thank you, Chair. Um, I'll do a quick introduction and then I will I will leave members to, to discuss the, the applications. Um, so thank you for your time today to discuss the community regeneration funding applications submitted for consideration in your area. Ahead of today's meeting, members will have received the application form and a RAG summary spreadsheet highlighting the outcomes of the technical assessments undertaken by the CRF team. Please note that the RAG assessment is undertaken on information that has been provided to us by the applicants during the application process, where a project has been awarded red or amber against any criteria. This does not reflect an eligibility issue, but does flag up that there are outstanding concerns or that only brief information was provided within the application. If members wish to approve projects that have red or amber ratings, then we would usually seek to ad address these concerns by applying technical conditions to any funding award made. I, I um, wish to update members with regards to some changes to applications um, since the committee papers were issued. As members are aware, within the umbrella of community regeneration funding, we administer the Highland Coastal Communities Fund and the Place Based Investment Program. Both these funds are what we call area funds, so the award of these funds sits with local elected members. But CRF also includes the community led local development funds called CLLD on behalf of the Highland Strategic LAG. So we have now met with the LAG who have agreed final grant awards for projects from the current year's allocation. Um, and I'm happy to say the, that following the recent award of additional CLRD funding from the Scottish Government, the LAG have been able to increase the level of CLRD contribution to some of the projects, subsequently reducing the ask from area funds. So more particularly in, in Le Haber, um, this is the case for projects reference CRF 1164 from the Communities Housing Trust. So the approved CLLD grant for this project has increased to £71,000 and therefore the ask, the ask from area funds has been reduced to £23,490. To £23, and in addition to this change, um, project reference 1146 from the Akarakal Community Company um, they have amended their project to fit with the current funding spend deadline of March 24. So they have a full-time regeneration officer post for one year, which means the project costs um, have been amended. They are now in total £37,760. The match funding now totals £3,000 and the grant request to be considered by members today for this project has been subsequently reduced to £34,760. So in summary, in Le Haber, this means members are asked today to consider 12 applications with a total grant request of £616,139.40 with available area funds totaling £487,138.12, meaning the funds are oversubscribed. So we are asking members to decide today whether to approve, defer or reject applications under consideration, and in the case of approvals, to agree the grant award amount and any conditions of funding they wish to attach over and above the technical conditions that we will attach arising from the technical assessments. So, Chair, I will now hand over to you to discuss the projects with your fellow members, but I remain available to answer any queries that may arise during discussions. Thank you. 
Um, thanks, Marianne, and um, thank you for the updates on um, the changes to those two funds. So um, I hope we've we've got the spreadsheet with the information and the the RAG scorings, um, and we'll just we'll work our way through that. So I'm going to start at the top with um, the first application is 1028, which is Kilmalley Shinty Club and Lock Arbor Rural Education Trust. Um, if anyone has any questions and whether we're minded to approve, defer or reject the application. So I first, um, does anyone have any questions about that application? Okay, so, no. so um, I think firstly, I guess so, would we like to approve this application? I would like okay, not to approve this application. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. I think I agree. Um, I would I would be recommending that we defer it. It was everyone in agreement with that. I mean, not That's defer it, reject it. Sorry. Yes. yes. Agreed. <clears throat> Is this agreed? Yep. So moving Thank on you. to 1021 Lock Arbor Hope for new connections. Um, do we have any questions about this application? Okay. Yes, just one yeah. question. How sustainable is the application? Is, is it something that will need to be to, to happen again in future? Um, yeah, I think my understanding is that because of the longer term lease on the property that um, <coughs> funding will be ongoing beyond the, the one year that is being asked for. Would that be correct, um, Marianne? Um, yes, that's correct. Um, currently, the the applicant um, don't have um, a lease, a long term lease secured on the property. Um, this application refers to the cost of of running the project for a year, um, and the applicant states they are trying to secure a three year lease for for the building um which would indicate that they would need funding for at least three years if the if the lease can be secured chair i fear if this were funded it would it would encourage or take it take um take it take us down an unsustainable take them down an unsustainable route i i fear we ought to decline this one As, as much as it's, you know, it, what Lock Arbor Hope are doing with New Connection is mm. a fantastic project, but I'm afraid, I think in this instance, I would be inclined to um, reject this application as well. I, I agree with that. Unfortunately, <coughs> it's a, it, it is a, there doesn't appear to be a route to long term viability. And so yeah. funding is provided this year. It doesn't explain how we're going to match the deficit in future years. So it's a very, very worthwhile cause. And I think all the councillors agree that they do a fantastic job. But the long term viability of Loch Havre Hope is a, has a big question mark over it financially. Of, of the new connections project, certainly. Yeah. Mm. Um, Thomas, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um... Like La Habra Hope has been on the go for must be coming up for 16 years now, and um, it does a lot of good in this area. So I don't want to see this turned down just out of hand. Um, I'm leaving them in a position of, you know, we don't think you've got a future. This is a voluntary sort of thing, and people, a lot of people are quite grateful for La Habra Hope being there. So I would like to leave it in a position whereby they've got hope for the future. And by future, I mean near future. And I would also like to see, because we've only got a finite amount of resources, but the problems that La Habra Hope deal with are widespread and are going to get worse. We have to make what resources we've got go as far as possible. And I would like to see some kind of mechanism, some sort of action plan put in place whereby we speak to Voluntary Action La Haber, we speak mm -hmm. to um, La Haber Hope, we speak to the Nevis Centre and any other interested bodies. 
I'll put it too fine a point that we'll knock heads together and try and make as much bang for our buck as possible that helps the people that need the services of these organisations. That's what I would like to see us leaving this position. If we can't give them the money, we at least give them, I'll borrow the term, hope <laughs> for the future, but we we utilise all the resources that are available to Inla Harbour and get them all singing from the same hymn sheet and try and make our money go as far as possible. Definitely, yeah. um, definitely, Thomas. I think we're all we're all behind you on on that one. And I think just definitely. important to note this isn't this is support for the new for new connections, um, which mm -hmm. is a project being run by Lock Harbour Hope. <coughs> so, um, did someone else have their hand up? I think the did. That's good. There's nothing in there. No other hands up. So I think in so. Um, oh, John. Oh, John. <coughs> Sorry, Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, just to support basically what Thomas said, I think Thomas said most of what I wanted to say, which is why I sort of pulled my hand down. I think the only other thing I'd like to add in there is there's a lot of things taken on by third sector organisations that at some point are actually a council responsibility. So there's something about if we don't give funding to some organisations, we might find that coming back on the council anyway in terms of statutory requirements. So I, I think, yeah, like Thomas said, I think we need to really look at it and maybe a deferral might be worth. Thank you. Um, Thomas? Sorry, just come in one more time. Um, it was just to sort of, instead of just making this as a suggestion, or maybe it would be a question to Dot, or I don't know if Emma's on line, but how would we go about actually engendering getting talks amongst people that provide these services? Like, how do we take that part forward, or how would you envisage that suggestion coming to fruition where we actually get people speaking to each other? <coughs> yeah. We arrange a meeting. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to say th thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly through the uh, Fort William Community Action Group and other partners, we can easily um, ask for a meeting with the relevant people and just see if there is some mileage in trying to, to get the different groups to work together. So happy to take that away as an action. So, yeah, that would be. Yeah, thank you for that, Dot. We would like to see that taken forward. Sarah? But back to this project. Uh, uh, it's not just about Lohab, I hope it's about new connections, uh, a different approach to mental health, which is not about offering counselling service, but giving people the chance to meet and be together. It's absolutely essential that new connections can be done. And it breaks my heart because of the lack of sustainability actually in the, in the, in the application that I will have to reject it at this stage. But we've got to make sure we are not closing the door. And as soon as this meeting is finished, we, we start thinking of what mechanisms we can put in place to help new connections, as uh, uh, Councillor McKinnon actually was uh, uh, saying a um, few minutes ago. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Sarah. Yep, and, and, and we're all, yeah, yeah, I think we're all in agreement that it would, we would really like to see this project continuing, and we'll do what we can to help. Um, but in this particular instance, I think at this stage, certainly. Um, I would, are we agreement that we will be rejecting this application at the time? Yeah, we are. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, with a, uh, yeah, with uh, a heavy heart. But, uh, Thomas? Like, like uh, are we not just sort of parking it? Um, like, um, you know, I just feel that, like, just saying no, um, okay, I'll withdraw. I can see that. There's no point in beating a dead horse here, <laughs> but I, I just, I just feel that we should give them hope for the future. I know it's a terrible pun to use that, but, but I'll withdraw my my dissent. Yeah. So, so um, there's certainly there are going to be future funding rounds, Thomas. So we would hope that we can work going forwards for um, to help with the resubmission of an application in a future funding round. So this certainly isn't isn't the end of it. If that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on to 1103 Fort William Marina and Shoreline CIC for a feasibility study. Um, do we have any questions about this application? 
Seems a lot of money to, for a feasibility study. Yes, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, possibly a, a bit more clarity um, in this application on what is actually being proposed and the outcomes I certainly th would have found useful. <clears throat> um, I would be recommending reject that we reject this application. Do I have do we have agreement on that? You have my support, Chair. Yeah. I agree. I agree we reject it, but I think that um, the proposers of it should um, meet with me and we can see if we can tie it into the ambitions of Lock Harbour 2040, where it has a, a natural um, a natural fit anyway, I think, for you know, yeah. sharing the coast. And, yeah. Yeah. But certainly um, various parties involved in further discussions going forward with Fort William 2040. Thomas, do you have your hand up? I'm just going to rinse and repeat what I said the last time. I think we just delete La Harbour Hope and put in Fort William Shoreline. We should, at the end of the day, this is a voluntary group that have done an amazing thing for Fort William. And if certain individuals hadn't got up off their backsides and moved things, we wouldn't. We would just have a West End car park, and that's all. We wouldn't have any marina there. So again, I'd like to give them hope for the future and. I go along with the suggestion Angus made about, but I, I, I think when we reject things out here, we should at least try and give people hope that they've got a something that the, that we're not knocking it out back out of hand because these people took a risk doing what they've done, and I, th I think we should help them as much as we can because we need people like that that will drive a project on. They may tread on toes while they're doing it, but they move things forward, and without them, the I think it would be a pooder place. Um, yeah, t um, I totally agree, Thomas. Um, and that the pontoon is a, is a wonderful asset and the work that's being done to, to get that up and running is fantastic. I think just in, in terms of this one, the application, I felt certainly that there was there was just a lack of clarity on what the what the objectives and the outcome were going to be from this application and that once again that they can if f going forward there's opportunities to resubmit to, to future funding rounds um so st i would still be re um, recommending that in, for now we reject this application um and if we have overall agreement on that agreed chair Yeah. Any other agreement? Are we agreeing? Yes. Me. Yeah. So the majority. But yeah, but not to, but to continue working forward with this. <coughs> Moving on to one one four zero, the Isle of Canna Development Trust, Corrigan Barn Redevelopment. Do we have any questions about this application? No, so no. I'm, I would be proposing that we accept this I application. Would, I would go with that, Chair. Yes. Yeah, and so would I. I think the, the, Good project. the building is an extraordinary asset to the people of the island and visitors, and I, I think it's, um, it would be fantastic if it was re regenerated and rebuilt. Yes, agree with you, Angus. I've lost. So, are we? Do we have approval for one one forty? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Moving on to one one six four, which is the Community Housing Trust, Glengarry Affordable Housing and and Woodland. I think it is the and um, Wood. Sorry. Um, and as Marianne um, outlined earlier, the redu reduce funding amount on this. Um, are we? I would be happy to suggest that we approve this application. Does anyone have any questions? I'll, I would go with that, Chair. Um, this is 23 sounds good. Yeah. I yep. think it's a very cheap way of us getting four affordable houses. Exactly. Mm. So we should go for it. Okay. 
So the exact amount we'll be approving on this, I think, was 23,490. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yep. Is the um, adjusted amount due to other funding. So are we in agreement that we're approving Please. this? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I agree. Please yeah. note, Andrew. Yes, noted, Angus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, application 1118, the Urum Skio for electric community car share and transport. Um, I would, I would certainly be happy to um, approve this application. Any questions? We're approving a single car, aren't we? Um, the, due to the change in, Marianne, would you like to, because of the changes in amounts for the other applications? So, so this this application is is relating to the purchase of of one um, one extra car. Yes, much funding has been secured to to purchase purchase another one. So, all in all, the applicant would have two electric vehicles, which would mean they could increase um, the the hospital transport service um, to then expand to possibly other medical appointments and also a community car share scheme. Thank you for the for the, for clarifying. I'm, I would be happy to accept to approve. Do we have what? There's a heck of a large amount of money, but I think it's probably a very worthwhile cause. So I, I, I vote in favour, but the amount of money is colossal. It's not just uh, yeah. I know, I know. other things behind. Are we? Yeah, in general that. agreement. <clears throat> yep. Yes, okay. I think yeah. so. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, one application 1006, the Morven Heritage Society for Lock Island Sand Mine Heritage Trail. Um, oh, so that's a good one. Once again, yeah, I think this is a, a fantastic project for the village, and I would be happy to accept to approve it. I'm with you there. Yeah, I support the recommendation. Yep. Yes, okay. that would be good. Application 1146, the Akarakal Community Company for the Community Regeneration Project, which is, um, so this would just be for the uh, project officer for one year, so I'm the in. reduced amount is 34,760, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yep. Um, I'm happy to approve this project. I'm in favour. With, with that. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, one, two, four, two for the Isle of Egg Housing Trust, um, Old mm -hmm. Surgery Affordable Homes for Rent. Once again, um, a fantastic community led housing project that um, I'm happy to approve. I think we should go for that. Yes, I think you need to. Okay. Intent. Approved. Yep. Um, one one five zero pool regeneration company for final works on the Thomas Telford Corpac Marina, which um, it will be absolutely fantastic to see this project finished for the area and um all the things that will come with it. So I'm happy to approve this project. I'm in favour. Likewise. Yes. Yes, no, good idea. Get it finished. Support. Yep. Excellent. 1145, Glencoe Folk Museum, um, Capital and Activities Redevelopment, so which the, the funding they're requesting for this is final match funding towards and they've just been awarded heritage lottery fund funding as well. Can I this page? Can I withdraw from this? Being a volunteer, or having been a volunteer at the Glencoe Folk Museum, so I will not uh, say anything. Okay. Um, I'm certainly um, happy to approve it, given this is just the final match funding required for the whole project to go ahead. I'm Absolutely. Afraid. Totally agree. Yeah, good idea. 
Lucky Glencoe. Yeah, we look forward to visiting the museum. And massacring some camels. <laughs> One two four zero oh, Egg Trading Limited, um, Green Shed Business, and Coast Guard. And I can't read the final words. Um, I'm once again happy, very happy to approve this application. Likewise. Yes, Likewise. No, good idea. Okay. Uh, I think, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's all of them that I can see on the spreadsheet. Yes, perfect. Thank, thank you, members. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, we look forward to seeing all these amazing um, projects progress and to visiting them when they're completed. And yeah, good luck to all, to everyone to take these forward. Very much so. so thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for all your work um, behind all this. And thank you for joining us this morning, afternoon, this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for your time. And and I'll just add, um, I know obviously some difficult decisions had to be taken for a few of the projects, but we we will give feedback feedback to the applicants that, you know, it is not the end of it and, and there will be discussions taking place um, in the future. So we, we will give them hope. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we look forward, yeah, and we'll, we'll look forward to supporting. We're very sorry for rejecting all the applications, the funding wasn't there, and um, but we look forward to helping them progress going forward. Marianne, I saw what you've done there. <laughs> thank you very much John, for your time you, today, members. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. John, did you have a question for Marianne? It was just a quick question. It might not be able to answer it. I, I think that leaves some money still unallocated. Is that correct? A very small amount, John, no, so, yeah. um, which um, I think is then carried forward into the next funding round. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Have you worked out how much it is, John? No. It's at six hundred pounds. Oh, six hundred pounds. Okay. We'll go down the pub, won't we? Maybe another time. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. So moving on to um, item item nine is appointment of Lock Harbour Local Access Forum. Oh, uh, have we got not got item eight? Oh, sorry. Um, Place-based in item eight. Place-based investment funds reallocation of funding allocation, and I think um, Dot is just going to give us an update on that. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this relates to an allocation that was made uh, last November, um, in terms of, in fact, November 21, in terms of the place-based investment funds where £5,000 was allocated to La Haber Housing Association, um, who had intended carrying out a, an assessment of housing need across La Haber. Um, unfortunately, quite recently, they've told us that just because of the uncertainty just now um, around potential rent freezes and the other impacts, that they don't feel it's the right time to progress um, that study and therefore have um, said to us that they cannot use that £5,000. So it's an opportunity uh, for members to reallocate that. Um, the other uh, projects which were supported at the committee in November 20. 2021 are listed at item 4.1 and most of these are either complete or well underway and none of them require the, the further funding at this time. However, in terms of the support for community planning, £8,200 was allocated to um, help deliver the objectives of the cool locality plan. Um, they have used most of this or it's already committed and so there are still outstanding actions within the, the cool locality plan and therefore it's recommended that the £5,000 um, is allocated instead to the 
community action group for, for COOL. I should have said that this funding actually came from the Ward 11 um, element of the place-based investment fund, um, but still requires uh, a full, full majority of the committee support. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dot. Are we, um, do we have any questions and are we happy to agree the reallocation of the £5,000? Yes. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think more than happy, yes. yes. Good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dot. Uh, item nine, appointment to local, to Lokaba mm -hmm. Local Access Forum. Um, this is just for the committee being asked to appoint one member to the to the access forum. Um, would anyone, do we have a proposer for a member to join the access forum? Councillor Willis, uh, seems to be quite knowledgeable on these issues. I propose Councillor Willis. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Councillor Willis would be excellent at this job. <laughs> Thank you, Angus. <laughs> are, are we happy with that? Uh, yes, is Councillor Willis happy yes. with that? Yeah, I'm. Ha I'm very. Yeah, I'm happy to represent sure. um, members on the access forum. Please and and report back. Thank you. Good. Well, agreed. We'll be happy with that then, Kate. So, item ten is the ward discretionary budget. This is for noting. So, <clears throat> all noted. For wards 11 and 21. Noted. And yep. noting item 11, mot noting the minutes of the last meeting of the Lock Harbour Committee, which was on the 7th of November 2022, and were approved by Council on the 8th of December 2022. Thank you. All noted. Noted. So, yep. Thank you for attending this morning's meeting. Um, that concludes business.